Okay, yeah, thank you, Shekhar. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, I think it's, you, are, you are spending your time here just to, to do some work or to get some work done. And this is preparing conferences and presentations is not very, very nice work. But nevertheless, thank you. I think uh, I'm challenging for everyone here. Thank you. And as I think Ricardo explained, PyPy, well, it's about trying to implement Python or a co in Python itself. It's, they are really, it's an interpreted dynamic language, so an implementation is to contain a parser and compiler that takes your Python source code and makes Python byte code out of it for the virtual machine. Then there is really a, a virtual machine where, like in Java or small tool, that will interpret this byte code, which is indeed is mainly uh, some kind of loop that reads one byte code and those the instructions that, that are needed to for these operations. And as I said, is a strongly Python is a strongly dynamical type, which means that your program you don't have declaration for types and types declaration are not used when you compile this program, but at runtime data, you, your values in the program are carried around these small boxes that contain type information that this is used and checks about whether you are not trying to add a string to an integer, which is not a load in Python, are done at runtime. And well, and it, it's software object-oriented programming feature with quite a, a clean model. And this model is also there at the sea level because the interpreter, the normal usual Python interpreter is not written in Python but it's written in C and the API for objects that you see from application level is also mostly there also at the sea level and people write extension for example too. And as I said, well, the, there are various Python implementation already. The the main one is what we call C Python, which is indeed a Python written in C, and is the one that was started well by Python inventor and what now is called the benevolent dictator for life, <laughs> because it drives well, the development of the language, which is Guido van Rossum that well right now he works at Google uh, after a long journey <laughs> from Europe to the US. And then another implementation is Jiten, and well, for a while I was one of the main maintainers there, which is a, a Python implementation written in Java, and, and which instead of having its own interpreter, it really compiles Python at runtime into, into Java bytecode and, and runs this one. And then there is something similar, which is Iron Python, which is a project now going on at, at Microsoft, started by Jim Mugumi which is the guy that started Jiton 2 and now works at Microsoft on Tizai of Python, which is the same thing mostly as Jiton, but for the .NET environment. And then we have PyPy, which will try to be a Python in interpreter written in Python and together with a tool chain to start with this Python in Python, which is quite slow when you run it on top of one of the... Well, now you can probably only run on top of CPython, but when you run all of, its, all of this PyPy code that is a Python interpreter on top of CPython, it's quite slow. So what we need is to be able to translate this Python code in some way to, well, again, to some low-level language, like C again. And, and so PyPy is not only the Python interpreter, but it's also a tool chain that allows us, but there is a later part of the talk is about how this translation process works. Some facts about the project. Well, it started to be a grassroots open source effort in 2003, mostly initiated by some people that were already involved in the Python community, but well, mainly that are here, Armin Rigo, there, that will also give another part of the talk, and Christian Sismer over there. <laughs> And all the record which is not here, which is also indeed mostly Python developer, but well, mostly 
are all in Europe, based in Europe, not, not much involvement from the US side of this. And indeed the aims of the project are, are greater flexibility, because indeed, as we said, we have already C Python, which is a Python implementation, it's written in C, it's nice, it's sort of fast, considering that it doesn't have a just-in-time compiler, but a lot of decision about the language and the implementation, a lot of detail are fixed there. And we hope by writing Python in a higher level language, Python itself, to be able to have a code base in which it's easier to change this thing. And as a code base that doesn't encode this detail, and the detail instead are added by what I said this translation process, but we will say more about this later. And we use a style of development, we try not to do too much design up front, or well, not. And we do test driven development, that means we try to write more tests for the next feature we are going to add, and then code to get them passed. And now a, we are partially funded by the EU since the end of 2004, and so we have to be doing our project which will end in November of, of, of this year, which is mostly divided into phases, and indeed the first phase was about finishing this Python implementation written in Python and having a first version of the translation tool chain that can produce a self-contained PyPy translated, for example, to C. And well, we have some amount of people that follow us. PyPy Dev, which is our main list for development, has around 300, 350 subscribers. In the meantime, we wrote quite a bit of code. <laughs> One, 150,000 lines of code, and but the interpreter itself is probably only 50 hundreds, and all the rest is is test and the translation tool chain, which indeed is, is more complicated than the interpreter. <laughs> and we're, well, we are an open source project and we use the MIT license. And so far in this first year of the project, we had three releases, public releases. The first one was uh, the 0 0.6 in May of last year which was mostly about releasing the interpreter and this release could already pass some part of the tests that are part of the CPython standard library. There are a huge set of tests that we could already pass. And this one was simply just running, could only be run on top of CPython. Then we have the 0 0.7 and quite a bit of work went from 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 to finish re-implementing things that were missing. So that on one end we had a more compliant version of PyPy and on the other end it was all the parts were there such that we could really take this Python code in 0 more than, than C Python with the translated PyPy. Well, and we, we don't only give talks at conferences or when we are spring, but we try to have quite a bit of documentation on our website. And the development one is this at codespeak.net, which is a website that was also the open source project. And indeed, because we are an EU project, we don't only write documentation for the community, but we have to write reports for the EU too. <laughs> and so in the summer of last year, we were quite busy writing reports for <laughs> about the first period of the... And indeed, when we, we do talks, we, we write papers and when we participate in conferences. And as I was saying before, we are an open source project and we try well to, to have a method of development that fits with the community and with the open source style. And one peculiarity in dealing with the sprints, which is what is happening right here, here this week. Because it, well, we are a huge, not a huge project, but a project with various companies, one university involved, seven partners in total, and we work all distributed, but we each six weeks we gather in some place to, to really work 
one place and, and, and things like us doing design work, helping communicate what one group somewhere did to, to the others and also when pushing forward the development work we really try to, to decide and design what to do next. As I said, we are we are using a generator in the sense that we, we don't try to design too much up front, but we try to, to think about how to prototype the next thing that we need with so small amount of code and also to write this with write tests first, which means we do test driven development. And indeed we, we, we try to, to keep an open source code to, even if we have the, the funded aspect together with the rest. Well, and now really about PyPy, the technical side of it. It really tries to implement Python in itself, so we have this 50,000 lights of what looks like really, really Python code that you can run on top of CPython and it is a complete Python interpreter. But well, to tell the truth, because as we said, this PyPy Py running on top of CPython is low and is not also not self-contained, you need CPython to run. We really would like to be able to translate all this code. So instead of really using all of Python, we have kind of invented and we use for a large part of it is interpreter a subset of Python, which means it's a subset, it means it still runs on top of CPython, which was very good to run when we were testing these things. But it also means that in the, our tra translation tool chain can make sense of it and produce low-level code. And the way indeed our translation makes sense of it is that this Python is quite dynamic and this our Python kind of make a lot of assumptions and wants the program to be more steady, but this allows us to do type inference. Basically, a normal Python program you don't have types, but, but our tool chain is able to, to deduce what, what types we really have values at runtime that flow through, through the program. But on the other hand, because we use this approach where we are really writing Python and some parts are a subset, for what we say it's good time or good strap time when everything is loaded before we start the analysis, we are really unrestricted. And we use this quite a bit to, to avoid repeating code, like, like we can dynamically ex execute snippets of code that, to do boring repeated definition and this kind of things. Then, well, the PyPy architecture, PyPy as interpreter for Python, well, it's similar to the other Python implementation. We have a parser and compiler. We have a bytecode interpreter, which literally loop over bytecodes and do what is necessary. And then one peculiarity of PyPy is that we really try to separate this interpreter that loops over the bytecode from the part of the code that knows how our objects and values behave. That means all, all the things about type implementation, what should happen when I have an int and an int and I add them, is as isolated in what we call as an object space, which is indeed a library with the type implementation and indeed the bytecode interpreter treat the Python value objects as black boxes and then when it needs to do something with them it kind of delegates to the object space. And this also means that between the bytecode interpreter and these object spaces there's a, there's a clear interface and we were and we were used that for example when we see the tool chain. One can take this interface and implement it a bit differently, but there is more about that later. But so the fact we get a Python interpreter, a Python VM by, by taking the interpreter and having the standard object space. And the standard object space is the one that really implements the normal behavior expected by from Python objects. <coughs> and then to complete this to have something that really works and can well, for example, run and use the module in the Python standard library, we also need built-in and a series of built-in models that are not written in Python itself, but in C Python are written in C. And in the case of PyPy, they are written in Python again. 
ported to client. And here again in a picture, if you start with the user program, it will be compiled by the parser and compiler. We get bytecode, this goes through the interpreter rule. And as I said, each time the interpreter really needs to do something with the values at runtime. It doesn't contain code to do it itself, but it dispatches and delegates the operation to what we call the object space. Well, the parser of compiler is quite classical, and it was really just finished and added to the 0 0.8 release. It parses Python by code and two abstract syntax trees. That means trees with nodes. This is an addition. This is. And then there is code that takes these abstract syntax trees and produce bytecode. And we really reuse in a in a declarative format, some file in a textual format that defines the grammar. This grammar is the same as CPython. And we know at the grammar when we bootstrap our interpreter, when the interpreter starts and before we translate this grammar file is written, is read and interpreted. And then there is work going on now in this second phase of the project to let instead people change the grammar and the syntax at runtime. But this is ongoing work. Then there's a small example about this is Python syntax to define a function, and Python well is interpreted, so here we have an interpreted prompt, we can do it at runtime. This is a function, it takes whatever object that implement the indexing, index at access, and we are trying to access the first element, the second element there, because Python indexing is zero based. So f of this is a list, and the second element is two. And Python has a model called list, which does this assembling of the bytecode. So here we can see what I was talking about. This is the bytecode for, for the function f. And we have, well, code to load the co a constant, which is the one that appears there. We have load fast, which is to access what we call the locals. L, L is a local parameter, well, it's an argument, it's local to this function f. So it gets a slot with a number and we read it. And then, there is a generic operation which is binary sub subscript, which is what should happen here. We we'll have an object, we have the bracket which do some kind of indexing, and we take L and 1, and we do a binary subscript on both of them. And indeed, in the, as I explained in the PyPy architecture, the interpreter would go to this, and the interpreter usually care about well, these kind of operations. But when it gets here, it has the two objects, and it will, it will really ask the object space what to do with them, and using an operation that it's, well, it's called get item in the space. And as I said, well, we have these bytecode interpreters, which really interpret as bytecode and code object. And then, we, as we saw in this small example, there are these local variables, and, and this is for each function, when you run it, you need, you need state as long as you run it, and this state is, is saved in what we call a frame. And a frame usually indeed contains lots to store all the local variables values. And when the interpreter indeed then will implement the control flow behavior like it, it has bytecode for jumps or bytecode to check whether something is true or false. And indeed, the, the going back to the bytecode is done by the interpreter. Instead, the checking the truth values is also delegated to the space. An object will get to a point where you want, need to do a decision, and the, the whether is true will be asked to the object space. Which indeed, as I already explained, is really the, the library that describes all operation on, all, on Python values. And one thing, and one aspect of PyPy, 
which indeed increase the flexibility. Yeah, this separation also means that you can slightly change the semantics of Python. You keep the interpreter, but you write new object spaces, or you take an object space and you derive from it and change little things. And one of the things that we experimented in phase two is to write a small variation on the standard object space, which is through written as a wrapper around the standard object space that allows to have lazy computed objects. You can really take a function and then you wrap it in something that we call a tank. And this is an object which is completely, it's kind of a box, but when it arrives to a point where you, it's really used because you are about to do an operation through the object space on it, then the function will be called, you get a value, but it's up and only there, so you have this lazy computation. Yeah. And then, as I said, the final part that is needed to get really a working Python is to have also the fundamental built-in modules. And at least so far, we well implemented all, all the fundamental models like Sys, which is mostly to, it's a model through which you can access the internals of your interpreter and as well. No, getting information about an exception that was raised by your program, and then well, we have OS, which has functions like read and write files. And as we said already, with 0 0.6 and 0 0.7, we are passing well around the 90, more than the 90 percent of of what we call the core of standard library tests, which are really tests that don't depend on strange models, but on the, on the fundamental ones and on the semantics of the language. But, well, there is still work to do and some models are still missing. And now uh, an animation to, to, to show a bit this, this aspect of the architecture about object spaces, interpreters, and this is a small Python program that takes, well, it, it, it will sum the elements inside a sequence, so it has a total, and then it, it has a, an eye that will go over the range of indexes into this set sequence. This is the length of the sequence. So if the sequence is the least 1, 2, 3, it will go over 0, 1, and 2. And then each time we read an element from the, from the sequence and we add the value to the total. This is our program that as we saw we then get compiled into bytecode. This here is our interpreter and precisely even this part here as we say is the local state to this function while it's executed, it would be a frame and here instead in the frame we will contain this these objects, these Python values, which from the point of view of our interpreters are really boxes, black boxes, but they live inside this, which is the object space. And indeed the value lives inside the object space, and so we have the sequence. The sequence would be at the start of the function we call it, a list containing 6, 3, 8, and when the interpreter gets to this point before the 4, the total will be 0, and the index the first time around will be 0. And then we have the interpreter that goes a bit further, and the things that, as I said, it does, it sees this operation here, which we already saw in this small example, it would be indeed a binary subscript by code operation. And what we, we saw and was done is really the interpreter sees this and then dispatch and ask the object space to do a get item on this list and on index zero. The object space gives it back a six, which is the first element, and then this six is stored in the item in the state of the running function. And then the next thing is to do the addition. And similarly, this is done by, by, by the interpreter by asking the object space to do the addition between the current total and the, and the item value. And then the interpreter loops over the 
white code and while doing this each time it needs to do something with the values it will delegate this to the object space. And then, this is a strange example, this would be the, the fruit object space, which is indeed just for example, we don't have such a thing, but as I was explaining earlier, we have really a clean interface here between the interpreter and the object space, which means that we can, uh, as we can re re-implement this interface completely. And, and given that for the interpreter, the object in the object space are play boxes, they could be whatever. In this case, indeed, they are straight fruit. So, <laughs> in any way, the interpreter would simply go over the byte code and it would ask this strange object space, fruit object space, what, what it means to sum an apple and a banana. <laughs> <laughs> the one. But the interesting thing is that. Well, it will be explained later, but we are really using this property of the object space interface, and indeed we implemented strange, what strange object spaces that are used by the translation to train itself. Yes. Do you have a, a sense of fixed primitives for communication between the interpreter and the object space? Well, basically, the design of of the of the interface is really based on, on what on what are the, the Python byte codes because there is a strict well there is quite a relationship between what are the the Python byte code and corresponding operation that indeed exist and are possible <coughs> to be done on the objects. And also in Python there are so called special methods also which so, means so that the integer Integer really define their addition by having a special method which is called under under bar. That's why in the example the, the name of the operation were, were like this. Basically, well a fruit no but but well in the, in the Python way of doing things and indeed in the standard object space way of doing things, this six really has in object oriented sense a method called under under half. And basically the operation that an object space should expose are really based on both on this kind of special methods that are defined by, by the Python itself and as I said there was also correspondence to with the kind of bytecode that appear. But on the other end, the idea itself of the interface would remain if you if you rewrite this to be an interpreter for some other language, which is possible, it would be really be a matter to just change a bit the methods that delegate to, to the object space and then indeed change a bit the, the, the interface here, but the whole architecture would, would remain. You can really change, as I said, as I said with the tank object space, which is the space doing com lazy computer algorithm, you can either change a bit what happens inside here and you change the semantics, or you, you can work at, at this level and change the byte code, and then either you need to introduce the operation there or, or not. But these are really independent, so you can really evolve them. Okay, and then the next part of the talk, which is given by Carl, it's about really the translation. Are there yeah. more questions? Uh, about the interpreter part? Yeah. Uh, why, the, did, why did you select, choose the, the MIT license? <laughs> that one is for the end of the The MIT license was selected in five minutes in a pub in, after the first print. <laughs> On the basis that it's mostly the kind of license that we see a lot in Python in general. The G GPL, for example, is not common in Python. Yeah, it's, a, it's a question. The Python community in general is not using the GPL much. It's more in BSD kind of license. As I understand, the MIT license has, is more constrained than BSD, for example. 
Mm, no. It really it says do anything. Uh, no, it's only a two paragraph license. It's really very, very short. It's saying and do it whatever. It's a problem legally because MIT license doesn't say that you, you don't warranty anything about the program. But yeah, I think it does look like this. But no, but I mean, <laughs> it's, it's not very important. I mean, it's, it's, it's a yeah, kind of. Um, when you talked about the optimization, when you pass from 2000 or 200, it's lower than, than six, five Python, and then to six or ten or something like that, where are most of the optimizations? Done in the in the. They are mostly done on the translation to Chinese. So the interpreter was. Uh, there are very few fast paths added to the interpreter, but there was really also lots of work on the translation to Chinese. Which is what uh, he's going to talk about. Yes. Okay. Anything? Oh, okay. Oh. Okay. Um, now I'm going to tell you talk about um, how PyPy is translated to a different language. Yes. Because where we are now, from what Samuel told us. We have this compliant, nice uh, Python interpreter, which is written in Python. So it runs on any other uh, Python interpreter, but not on itself. So um, we need a way to take this Python interpreter written in uh, Python and translate it to a different language. And um, the architecture of this translator is uh, quickly described here. Um, we take again, we reuse parts of the interpreter, the bytecode interpreter, and, put, and um, do abstract interpretation, which means, um, yes, we don't calculate with the full values, but with uh, some abstract domain, which is a, um, yes, we, we, we compute, compute with abstract value. And this is done with a special object space, which is, which is called flow object space. And there's another animation where one can see what's happening here. Then with this, we produce flow, control flow graphs. And on these control flow graphs, we perform type inference to, uh, which is called in the PyPy uh, lingo annotation. And um, with the type inference, we discover the types of all the variables that occur in, in um, the control flow graphs first. And then um, we have basically a control flow graph that contains operations that still very much con uh, correspond to, to um, um, operations on Python level, like they are basically all the object space operations again. And um, it's quite hard to translate from these Python level operations to a lower level language. So there's another step which is called specializing, which replaces all the quite high level operations by low level equi equivalents. There will be uh, more about this later. And then the last step is actually generating, generating uh, a low level code like C or LLVM from from this specialized graph. And yes, this is this is a small graph. We start from our Python code, which is this restricted subject, uh, subset of Python, um, via abstract interpretation, produce a flow graph, perform type inference, have an annotated flow graph, then we specialize it to a low-level program, which contains um, only operations that are at the level of the target, and then we produce C code, which is then compiled and can be run without any underlying Python anymore. So, and then there is, um, yes, uh, oops, we come to the abstract interpretation. Basically, we have a special op um, flow object space and run the program we want to analyze with the bytecode of interpreter um, using this special flow object space. And um, the flow object space um, implements abstract operations, so that means that if, if, you, if you add something, you don't really add two numbers, but um, you add two abstract values, and the result is another abstract value. And as a side effect, the, fl uh, the flow object space records all the operations that the bytecode interpreter would like to perform, and produces a flow graph of the program that is interpreted. And yes, one of the nice features of PyPy is that this process starts indeed from live bytecode object. That means it really takes, um, before starting to analyze, the whole um, program is imported and lots of stuff can happen. And then at one point you stop and you take the bytecode to will see. And um, the interpreter runs this program in the totally regular way. 
and for every operation that it that it encounters, it again dispatches to the object space. So first we have the get item, and the get item of A, uh, of B and C produces another abstract value of D, and the addition of A and D produces a new abstract value of E. And this goes on for a while. And um, the side effect of these operations, the, as a side effect of these operations, the object space remembers the operations that were performed and the variables um, the operations were performed on. So it, it remembers that the first thing that the interpreter wanted to do was a get item of A and C, the result was D, and then an addition of B and D, the result was E. And by doing this, we, we can you know, generate local graphs. And there will be a bit bigger example for this later. Yes, okay, now we have these nice control code graphs that contain operations. And um, we still don't know what, know what the type of a variable is. We, we have code like A plus B, but we don't know are A and B lists or are they. I mean, if you, if you perform plus on two lists, then you get the concatenation of this, or are they integers or floats or whatever. So we would like to find out what the types of all these variables that we have in our real program are. And to do this, we, we perform forward propagating type inference. This means we, we, um, we forward propagate the, the types that we uh, get at the beginning to further down in the program. And this technique is used to infer types in programs. And to have a point to start from, the user needs to um, give the program the, the, the um, types of the arguments of the entry point function. So we start at one fu function, which is the entry point, and um, the user gives the type inference engine the, the types of the uh, variables of this function, uh, the arguments of this function, and from there on, the type inference engine um, infers the, the types of all other variables that occurs. And yes, um, and yet the general idea of this type inference is that it goes from, from very very special types that are inferred to more general types. So in the beginning it says, okay, every every variable um, is never filled with any type, and then we say, okay, maybe it's an in with the value six, and then okay, it, it also contains a, uh, can, could contain another value, so it's some integer, which means yes, and then later it might see, okay, it can just contain anything. It's that generally. Okay, and after, after type inference, we perform the step which is called specialization, which um, takes the, the annotated programs, the program with the type on which we perform type inference, and um, specializes these programs for languages, for language families, for, for, for languages that are more low level in the C sense, or more object oriented like um, Java, small talk. And um, yes, after the specialization step for a certain uh, language family, um, the graphs contain, contain only operations that, that are at this target level. I mean, for, for C, this would be we, we have some sort of structures and we can store values in this structure and allocate, allocate these structures and read values out of them and pass them around, have pointers and all these typical C operations. And then for the, uh, for the object oriented type system, you have classes with methods and instances, and you can call methods on the instances and pass them around. And after this, um, there is a backend which, which produces code out of the specialized program. And we have two complete backends. One is the C backend, which produces C code. And another backend, which is also very complete, is the LLVM backend, and LLVM is a very interesting compiler project called um, Low Level Virtual Machine. Uh, it's basically a project to, yes, it's basically a compiler project. Um, and then we are working on two other backends. One of them is JavaScript, and one of them is Squeak to have a language that is more high level than the other two backends. And for, for the function calls, we um, write by hand. Um, small clue snippets. I mean, for example, some things need to be need to interface with the operators with the underlying operating systems, and for these we need to write small C snippets. The it's this code. 
There are two functions, five divisors and this prime. Five divisors takes an integer as an argument and produces a list of all the divisors of this number. Uh, it's a very stupid algorithm. It just divides the number by all the numbers below it. And then it, it loops uh, for i in range 1 with, uh, until n plus 1. It's 1 until n because it's smaller than i is smaller than n plus 1. And then if n modulo i is 0, then we append the i to the divisor list. If not, not. And in the end, we return the list of divisors. And then with the help of this function, you can define uh, um, a uh, uh, function that checks whether the number is prime, which is called is prime. Uh, it just uh, finds all the divisors using this function, and um, the number is prime if the length of the divisors is two. It's of course a very stupid algorithm that uh, works. And um, now we feed, we feed this function as an entry point into the analysis tool chain, and we supply it with the information, okay, n is an int. This is all the information we give it, and then it starts occurring types. Oops, wrong window. Yes. So um, these are the flow graphs that, that were produced. First, you can see the function is prime. It's very simple, it doesn't contain any loop. It contains. Oops. It contains a call to the function find divisors. Uh, the argument to the function is n underscore zero. Oops. And it calls the function find divisors. It calculates the length of the result and checks whether the length of the result is equal to two. And this is the return value of the function. So zero is passed along to the return block. And then this is the this is the flow graph of of the divisor function. We can see there is a loop here. Here. And um, the loop contains a <coughs> condition, so it sometimes just terminates here and sometimes it still goes there. And appends, I mean, if, if the number is divisible by i, it goes there and appends i to the list and goes back there. You can look at it. Um, yes, I mean, mod is modulo at n and i or here. If this is equal to zero, we go along this path, if it's not uh, divisible by zero, uh, equal to zero, we go along this path. Basically, along this path, we store, we, we, we take the append method of the divisors list and store and call it with, with i as an argument. It means we store the value i into the list. And here we can also look at how type inference, type inference works. Basically, if you look, for example, at this, operation, which is the modular operations, and when, if we already know that n, n3 and i0 are integers, here below there you can see the, the type, which means some integers and some unimportant stuff. So if you know that this is an integer and this is an integer, then we can infer the modular operation of two integers is again an integer. And if we try to run the equal operation on v0, which is an integer, and 0, which, which is also an integer, we know that the result is some boolean, which is true or false. And yes, in this sense, this is done. OK, the next step um, is to do specialization for the backend, which I'm going to do now. Um, and the first thing we see is that our small, two small graphs that were there before and are here. And then we have a big number of additional graphs. And um, these, are the, these are helper functions that implement stuff like um, the append to a list or um, list resizing and, and all sorts of helpers that, that are needed for list operations. We can still look at our own functions. First thing we see is there are now two calls. The first call is is still the call to find divisors. The result of this is a pointer to a struct, which is uh, garbage collected, which is called a list, which contains a length field, which is a sign integers, and uh, an item field, which is a pointer to an array of signs. So uh, after the specialization step, we have really data structures and uh, operations that are really on the C level. You can also see this here. 
Before we had equal here, but now we know it's in, so we, we know that we can use the int equal here. And you can also see that this, this line was the length operation on the list before, and now it's a call to a, to a helper function that, that calculates the length. Yes, in the same way you can look at this function. It contains lots of calls to, uh, to helper functions, and the general structure is the same. Yeah, again, the Yes, here, down here you append by, by calling a special method, uh, function called lllappend list blah blah blah. And this is somewhere, yes, it's this one maybe? No, it's resize. This one. Yes, it does strange stuff. Okay, and now the, you can transform the graphs once again. And now we do optimizations on it. I'm not going to, into detail here but uh, looks quite scary. Basically, this is our small harmless is prime function uh, after all sorts of other functions where we signed this first graph here. So basically, this is prime. And we translate this now to C and run it. And now, yes, I mean, generate the C code, code, uh, code compile it, and runs the compiled C function with the argument 5. And surprisingly, 5 is Questions? Why? What's the goal of developing this uh, backend in JavaScript or Squid? No, I mean. I mean, Squid is basically, was, it's not finished. Squid was started because we wanted to, to have a backend. I mean, all the other backends that we have target a very low level language like the other yeah. And Sweet was started to provide a backend that targets an operator and an object oriented language. And one of the ideas is to, to target things like Java. So Sweet is was used for that. JavaScript was written because one of our developers was interested in. Is it is it seemed to me that this Python, Python and Python implementation seems seems complicated. It doesn't, it doesn't look very very easy to do it. Or at least the, the your flexible approach is is at least complex. Because there is there are also some you know some implementation in other high level languages. For example, in, in J, J Python. The implementation yeah, of well, Java, 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 and we could write a backend for Java and then PyPy runs in Java and PyPy also runs in C. Yeah, you know? the, the, from the point of view of complexity, is, is this more complex to implement in Python than in Java? I, the, the, the or it's itself, not comparable, no. I mean, perhaps it's... I, mean, but, it's uh, I think the right thing to compare is, is for example, well, it's really something that is going yes, to it's be it's said. Going to be. But one aspect that you, you, that you can get is it's, for example, getting an interpreter which is not bound. For example, your recursion depth is not bound by by your C stack, but by but by how, how much memory you have. And for example, Java Java doesn't have tile recursion or anything like this. So if you have an interpreter written there in Java and you write it in the normal straightforward style. You, would, you cannot get that feature. You can get it if you, st well, if you are writing really this Java by hand, you would have to do transformation and use exceptions, for example, to get the same effect. It's also a general research problem how to write interpreters in a very flexible way, without sacrificing performance, for example. So our approach is kind of, well, we're trying an approach, it is indeed kind of complicated, but seems to make sense, basically. So yes, I'll just give a few quick words on, on 
more specifically the translation aspects, which means that <coughs> Vedic ideas to take this Python code and turn it into C code, let's say, let's take this example. But in addition, during the translation, we can perform generic global transformations that would allow us to generate C code that has additional features. So, uh, as an example of the kind of feature I'm talking about, for example, you have GC, which is garbage collection, which means how you actually manage the memory. For example, in C Python, you have reference counting, which means the interpreter uses just reference counters everywhere. And when, if, if you want to go in C Python and change this, for example, you, you have to change the whole source code everywhere. And the other aspects are similar. I will talk about them in the next slide. CC means uh, coding convention. Yes. So yes, and but the, the key point is probably that indeed most have implementations to a fixed decision for many crucial design decisions. And instead instead we don't encode these at all in the in the source language. The interpreter is clean of all these decisions. They are weaved, so inserted by the translation. And which also has the advantage that then we can evolve the language itself by changing the interpreter, etc. And we don't have to worry about the impact of all these different aspects. I mean, in C Python, if you want to, to add features, then you have to add features and worry about reference counting all the time. And here we don't. Okay, so a few examples, the memory models, so how you handle memory. So, I mean, of course, Python itself is completely garbage collected, like Java, so you don't have any explicit memory management in Python. So we don't have ex any explicit memory management in our Python interpreter either. And instead, the, the C backend can insert reference counting everywhere, or just don't care again about memory management, in which case we have to use, for example, the BIRM garbage collector, which is a conservative garbage collector for C that exists and has not such good performance, but at least it's easy to use. <coughs> and we are currently working on other GC strategies, and we have small, simple examples of garbage collectors written that we are working to but the current work is in integrating this into the translation process. So this will allow us to generate codes that comes with its own garbage collector on its own read and write barriers on whatever is needed by the garbage collector or inserted at the proof point. Uh, another example is uh, multi-threading. If you have a high language like Python, even just one operation is actually doing a lot at the C level, and if you access the same data structure from two different threads at the same time, and you're not careful, you're going to mess up completely the C, the C level data structures, and the program just crashes. So, to prevent this, uh, the simple strategy, which is also in C Python, is to have a global lock. So only one thread runs at a time, actually. So you have multiple threads, but only run, one runs at a time. <coughs> well, it's kind of a very simple model. And we, are, well, we plan to experiment with more free threading models by, by doing things like inserting locks automatically at points that have been automatically detected to be where to be crucial points for specific locks. And we have another different approach, which is indeed, as Samuel described, which is to generate C codes in a different style. Instead of generate, I mean, if we have a code in the source Python code, we turn it, we turn it to, instead of, of a normal code in the C code, we turn it into a code that is able, well, in this case, a code that it, in some very convoluted way is able to not use this C stack. More precisely, we use the C stack a bit, but it's the code functions are able to interrupt the current processing and save the local variables away on the heap and then to be resumed later, which allows an infinite stack or, or, or coroutines or this kind of explicit context switches. 
soft threads, green threads, so called in Java, all this kind of thing is possible without changing the source interpreter, just uh, as a transition aspect. Uh, yes, it is a table that I also to give an, uh, an overview about about the uh, full approach, where we try to compare PyPy. Well, this tries to compare PyPy more to other developments, well, to other platform environments instead of comparing it to other language implementations. <coughs> The point is that unlike other environments like the GDM or the .NET framework, which, I mean, these frameworks come with more or less one decision for many high-level aspects, like how memory management should work and how how objects should look like, what a class should be. All this is hard coded in this environment, which has a, which has benefits like easy interoper interoperability, this kind of things. But instead, we think, I mean, with the PyPy project, we want to show that instead, by writing things that in a very high level language, we are free to choose various low level implementation aspects. And the interesting point, we are free to target variable environments. We can have a version that would compare to this environment or this one or C, which is basically no environment at all. Uh, okay, it's so the kind of thing we are working or will work on in 2006 are um, a specializing just in time compiler, which means, well, it's that's an approach that I will give a few hints about that, well, that I will talk about later. More on the Stackless, which means uh, various non C coding convention and massive multi threading approach. More on garbage collection, as I described, there is work in progress here. Our goal is to have some kind of reasonably good garbage collector. And most, most important of all, some kind of framework in which to experiment with garbage collectors. And then more, well, Less precise, long term goals, like for example, ex the fact example is about lazy object that we can add semantics in various other ways. For example, we could have an object space which is conceptually distributed over several machines but is still single object space. So, for example, if you have a huge amount of data, it could be stored so in some other machine but still appear like, for example, a huge string to your local program. <coughs> Transistance, which means that the data could be stored on disk completely transparently, but still appear to be normal objects to the program. Or security, which means that uh, all object accesses could be checked for some security policies. Okay, so, so I talked about just in time compilers. Uh, there is a project, well, Running a just in time compiler for Python is not easy, basically. I mean, if you compare it, um, languages like Java, for example, have a just in time compiler, which means the following we have Java, which is source code style to byte code, we have sequence of byte code, and at this level, a just in time compiler will take one function, or well, one method, and turn every, well, consider it globally with all its byte code and turn, turn this into assembler code that does it figure. So it's a normal compiler that is just in time in the sense that it will just take one method at a time instead of pre-computing it for the full program. For Python it's much more difficult because of, as we have seen, a single byte code has no clue what the type of the what the type of the value which resides will actually be. So you cannot just produce good assembler code that we do an int addition. Because this addition we see in the byte code, we have no clue it's actually an addition until that time. So the approach is much more delicate. And well, there is a project that exists that I wrote that is called Psycho, which 
which is uh, just in time specializer, more precisely to your use of Presley terminology, which I will well, not really try to describe here. And our goal here is to generate a specializer that is similar to this cycle project, to generate it from the source of PyPy as yet another translation aspect. Which means that we take the source code of PyPy, we translate it in our tool chain, we do a bit more, and what we get at the end is C code that instead of really interpreting the source of the program of the user, instead it does just in time combination of the program of the user. <coughs> and well, we have progressed a bit in this direction. We have started the Power PC backend for historical reasons. <laughs> The outlook of how it's possible to have such a such a result is that well, it's also a subject that exists and that is studied uh, theoretically. If you take if you take an interpreter for a program for a small language, say so an interpreter for a small language takes two inputs. One input is the user program to interpret. And the other input is input to the user program, like the function to interpret, and then the argument to the function to interpret. And then there is there are different techniques, like partial evaluation, that are generally regrouped under the name specializer, which means I take this interpreter, I suppose that I know the user function, but not the argument. If I know the user function, then I can look at my interpreter, take my user function and do some kind of constant propagation everywhere in the interpreter. And this thing will allow me to simplify quite some stuff already. Because for example all the bytecodes, looking up and dispatching stuff, all this can be done in advance without actually knowing what the real arguments to the function will be. So this is a generally known optimization technique, well, kind of hard to implement, so we are trying in this case, and hoping. So what we've done so far is, so I guess the goal is to take, to have such a specializer as an input to give the source code of the PyPy interpreter, so not the source code, the flow graphs of the PyPy interpreter, and we want to so, if we give it the flow graph to the PyPy interpreter and a user program, like uh, the uh, function from the user, we should be able to specialize this interpreter so that it's much faster but only works for this special function of the user. So, in this way, we get something that is a kind of a compiled version of the user function. So, it's a way to compile the user function only using an interpreter for the language in which the user function is written. So we are not writing a Python compiler at all. We are only writing a Python interpreter and generating automatically a Python compiler from that. So what we have done so far is what I just described. And then the next step is to do the same thing but faster because this process is just extremely slow. This specialization and constant propagation process is extremely slow. So, so then the, we are investigating techniques to to do this much faster so that it can be used at runtime time and become a just-in-time tool. So, this is my conclusion. We are basically developing a framework in which you can get just-in-time compilers for your favorite language for free. You just have to write an interpreter for your favorite language and hop, you get a just-in-time compiler. Which is the whole. Yes. Isn't this a kind of basic research on the on the topic? Uh, to some extent, yes. I mean, online partial evaluation and offline partial evaluation are known techniques which have many problems, and we hope with our approach we can circumvent many of these problems. And definitely this approach, and especially to get a just-in-time compiler instead of just a compiler, 
this is definitely uh, new yes. research. Yes. Is there any possibility of collaboration or integration or using uh, functionality or integrating things from PyPy for, with, for example, the Barrow project? Or for um, um, <laughs> uh, From our point of view, the Barrow project is a bit strange. That's it. I don't see, I kind of miss the point of the Barrow project. Uh, I think nobody, nobody understood that was because they just restarted the project a month ago. So they, they, they restarted the project, they, they reoriented the project. So per, per, six is based, per six will be based just on, on para project. Uh, but I, I mean, I don't understand the... I have no idea of the, yes, of the detail of the para project, but it seems to me that Perhaps you are more advanced in some areas. It's a question. <laughs> they are writing a lot of the MC. Yes, they are really writing a huge and very complicated field of machine in C code by hand. So, from our point of view, it's a very strange thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> one, one, of the, one, of the, one of the main issues with the power project of was the rougher encounter. They have this counter and everything in the whole code. I see. So they got just to, to do away the, the, the code and start again. Yes, we but have to avoid this, yes. But it's true that per 6 in, in details has two parts, which one is Parrot, which is really at the end written in C, and then there is the per 6 prototype, which is written in Haskell, and, and they are trying to have a kind of tool chain that indeed has some aspect that look a bit uh, yes, like. That there are, I mean, they are still in our technology. <laughs> our um, terminology, basically they, they are using object spaces now as well. <laughs> so there is... But about this, the last sentence in your slide, uh, yes. that means that we could have, for example, bar 6 in PyPy. Yes, yes. yes. So one writer interpreter. Yeah, because the writing in the sense of bar 6 is, is probably also rather in both, but... If somebody writes in bar 6 in terms of an R Python, then he will get... Um, just in terms of where from up. So we're going to have to learn. Yeah. 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 Well, so Maybe. <laughs> so who is going to be the next leader? Sorry, the group? Who is going to be the next leader? Well, the group. Not us. Yes, sir. In general, we're trying to stay away from language design issues also. Ido and some part of the Python development is really about language design, how to add features to the language in some way. And this, well, we're trying very hard not to go in this direction, so it's only implementation. It's only, yes. <laughs> Where is your main platform for development? The everything, but we use a lot of Linux and a lot of Mac OS X and a bit of Windows. And uh, in one particular way, you need some version, uh, CVS and uh, more recent CVS. <coughs> And uh, why the backend is in PowerPC, for example? Ah, uh, that's only because one of us has previously written a lot more for a PC assembler in Python, so he's really reusing it. But, mm -hmm. but I, I am in some corner of my mind, it's also an assembler for Intel in Python, so it should also be reusable. It's definitely sure. one, one of the things that we promised to the EU is writing backend for. I think or two platforms. For Intel. No, I think we expect to say Intel and PowerPC. Okay. This is still the thing we promised. Yes, well, it's all bit unclear because it's a bit early for this kind of thing. And it's not, it's not really the PR part. No, it's not from, from this kind of approach. <laughs> but still, a small question. What is the difference between the offline and online part of the again? Uh, and so, the Partial evaluator is a tool that takes a program and considers some things constant, and other not constant, and propagates this constant as much as possible. So what I just described, if you implement it as I just described it, you get online partial evaluation. Offline is when you know in advance which variables will be constant. But you don't know the value. Offline is when you can make a division in advance between this will be constant and this will be variable. And if you can, then you can propagate the division 
you can take a good program and you can say this will be constant, this will be variable, this will be constant, this will be variable. And from there you can do efficient partial evaluation then later when you really get values for the constants. So what does the offline online uh, mean? Does it come from the fact that I don't need to see my program in the actual data? Yes, probably. probably me, yes, it means that the hard files had working job. Here is done online. So if you have two chains that transform from the user program to something efficient, the specializer is online in, in the line of transformation. Also because the evaluation. But here it's off the line. It produces something that is used for in the line. Capable <laughs> online. Yes. And indeed, it's what it's what we the offline partial evaluation will is what we kind of try to start today. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we start with this. Take some time. And so, of course, if we had a Catalan backend, we could generate the top three with Catalan. <laughs> <laughs> but fortunately, we don't have Catalan languages. It's a little more complex than Python. Indeed, yes. indeed. <laughs> <laughs> So if you have more questions, maybe. Yes. And you can come up there and of course you have our website and documentation and you can join our developer list and ask questions there and IRC as well. So that's it all. Oh, thank you.